This episode is brought to you by VMGVinyl.com. Professional record cleaning, restoration, rejuvenation, and grading. Refresh your records with VMGVinyl.com. This episode is brought to you by Groove Washer, the best record cleaners and protective sleeves for your vinyl collection. Ask for the Groove Washer from your local shop or go to GrooveWasher.com. Discount code VinylGuide10. And now, on with the show. Welcome to The Vinyl Guide, the podcast for record collectors and music nerds. Here's your host, the biggest record nerd of them all, Nate Goyer. All right, here I am, ladies and gentlemen. Ah, mostly gentlemen, I, I know. <laughs> record collecting is a bit of a sausage-heavy sport. But uh, we here, we're, we're aware, we're inclusive, we aspire to be as diverse as possible, and everyone, everyone is welcome here on the show. And today's interview, I reckon, is one that everyone will enjoy. I spoke with Dennis Tech, who a lot of you know from his time with Australian legends Radio Birdman. But Dennis has had an incredible career featuring many other musical projects as well. We talk about a lot of them today, including New Race, The Visitors, his solo career. We discuss the legendary Epiphone Crestwood guitar that he bought from the MC5's Fred Sonic Smith. And now Dennis has played for over five decades. Dennis shares what it's like having the Prime Minister of Australia be a fan of your band. And of course, we discuss the records, the current reissues, lots of material coming out, including reissues of the Radio Birdman catalog. Dennis shares some great news on that front today. Oh, and by the way, this is the second time we've had Dennis on the show. First time was episode 138, where we discussed some of the rarities of the Radio Birdman catalog. So if you want to hear all about the Burn My Eye EP or the Trafalgar and Sire versions of Radios Appear, I suggest you check out that episode number 138 of the Vinyl Guide. Today, well, we touch a little bit on some of those areas, but we also dive deep into some other bits of the career and celebrate 50 years of Radio Birdman with what is likely to be their final shows scheduled for Australia later this year. And they've got some special guests on the tour, including other Aussie legends, hard-ons, opening up the Sydney shows. Google up Radio Birdman 5.0 and grab tickets quick. They are selling out fast. And, uh, oh, by the way, there's an extended version of this interview at patreon.com slash vinyl guide. Head over there now, help support our show, and get all the Patreon extras. I'm not going to belabor the point here. You guys have heard the spiel before. But look, we have plenty of extras up at patreon.com slash vinyl guide, and we could certainly use your support. So please join us there today, patreon.com slash vinyl guide. And uh, before we start the interview, I just want to quickly call out a few other vinyl guide episodes you may enjoy. I mentioned episode 138 when Dennis first came on the show. That's a great one. We also just reshared our Wayne Kramer interview, and that is one I think everyone will enjoy as well. Uh, Vale Wayne Kramer, you legend you. Um, John Densmore of The Doors was just on The Vinyl Guide, episode 433. Rick Beato, that YouTube music juggernaut, he joined us, episode 430. Uh, we talked to Eddie Kramer on his Times Engineering, Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin, Kiss, and more. That's episode 429. Uh, we spoke to Ed Cooper of The Saints, episode 396. And uh, we're going to go way back here with the final one I'm going to mention today. Episode 127 with James Williamson of Iggy and the Stooges. He's also made music with Dennis Tech. So it's all interconnected here, people. Follow the Vinyl Guide podcast in your podcast app and enjoy all those episodes and tons more. All right. With that, let's get into our conversation and talk with Dennis Tech on 50 Years of Radio Birdman. For some reason, Dennis, you uh, you don't seem to be aging nearly as rapidly as I do. <laughs> you, you, you're not living in this body, so you have no idea. <laughs> but, well, I, I need a different one because I think mine's wearing out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the difference between looking old and feeling old, that's for sure. Yeah. Anyway, good to see you, man. And uh, wow, uh, I didn't realize uh, we were so close to the cusp of Birdman 5.0. How does it feel now looking back 50 years of Radio Birdman? I can't believe it's, you know, it, it seems like 
uh, I mean, it's so far back that it's like it must have been another lifetime when we started. In, in one sense, it seems like the time's flown by and where did the time go? But then in another sense, it's like that was so far back that it's it's in another universe. So 50 years, there's a handful of shows in Australia. I'm assuming it's the, this Birdman 5 celebration is going to be just Australia. Is that the case? That's right, yeah. Seven shows. You know, I was thinking about the possibility of doing this for, you know, really for a couple of years. But during the pandemic, we obviously we had to stop touring then. You couldn't play anywhere. Mm-hmm. And then, um, then uh, late last year, I was in Australia for my daughter's wedding. And and I got together with Rob and, uh, and the, the rest of the guys. And we talked about it. And um, so we'll try it. And... And our manager started putting dates together. It actually started, the the whole idea didn't start until November. Wow. Okay. Because you knew the 50 years was coming, or maybe it just snuck up on you as well? Well, yeah. It's. I, I guess I realized it would be our 50th anniversary a couple of years ago. 74 to 24. It, you know, it's just a number. And there's actually an eighth show that was announced. I believe there's a... There's another show in Sydney now. The, the... Well, that's right. You're right. There is now uh, okay. because the first two sold out already. Are these the last Radio Birdman shows? Don't, well, you know, one never knows. Um, you know, we're getting pretty old, and I don't know how long, much longer our bodies will hold up. We're certainly not planning anything beyond this at this point in time, although, you know, we when we announced this tour, offers started coming in from other parts of the world. So I guess we just have to consider those and see if it's, see if it's going to be uh, practical to do it. Okay. Well, whatever you end up doing, hopefully you'll do another victory lap to where Sydney is the final stop. It just seems appropriate to play in Sydney last since we started there. And, and, you know, that's really our home. Who's the band lineup for these shows? It's the same lineup we've had for 10 years since 2014, several mm-hmm. tours. Um, uh, myself, Rob, and Pip, the keyboard player, that we're all founding members, the three of us. And uh, and then we have Jim Dixon on bass, who's been in the band for 25 years now. Mm-hmm. And the two new guys that have been in the band for 10 years are Dave Catley on guitar and Nick Reith on drums. Now, with 50 years of Radio Birdman, there's been so many changes, just culturally. The Australian Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, is a huge Radio Birdman fan, and he's quite vocal about his love for the band. So when I think of the progress that the band has made from getting booted out of you know, just about every Sydney pub to having the Prime Minister wear one of your band's T-shirts, I mean, that must be quite satisfying or mind-spinning, yeah? It, it's yeah, I can't. It's hard to get my head around that, really. I mean, I I like Anthony. He's a really good guy, and he's he's sort of um, he's a little bit younger than us, but he was he was old enough to be around, you know, when the band started and and to know about it. And I don't know if he went to any of those really early shows or not, but but yeah, he's a big music fan, and especially Australian rock and roll. So from going from where. We couldn't even get our photo in, you know, where reviews in in the Daily Mirror were getting spiked because they didn't, Rupert Murdoch didn't like the look of the photos and said, we're not having this obscenity in our newspaper. And this is the Daily Mirror. There's not a worse rag out there. And to go from that and being banned from not being allowed to play anywhere and having to start to put on our own shows in garages and things like that up to now where Albo wants to come to the show and have a beer with us backstage. That is a long, a long distance to go. And, um, you know, in a way we, we, in the early days, we sort of, we got to the point where we kind of reveled in the outlaw uh, stance that was sort of placed upon us, but then we sort of adopted it and said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll go with that. We can't do that anymore. 
<laughs> you're now part of the establishment. Is that what you're saying? That's right. That's right. Mainstream. <laughs> Yeah, for some reason, uh, Albo he 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 won't wear a hard on shirt. I'm not sure why, but he seems to always gravitate towards uh, Radio Birdman. So I haven't seen them w- with their new lineup with Tim Rogers singing. So that'll be interesting. Oh, they're f- fantastic! Yeah, yeah. When I moved to Australia, I, I didn't know a whole lot about a lot of the music scene that happened here that that preceded me. I moved here in 2001, so I had a lot of catching up to do, and part of that journey was getting to know uh, the music of uh, like the visitors and Radio Birdman, the scientists. Getting to know Radio Birdman was, uh, was, was absolutely a highlight. There's a few areas of the, the history of the band. For example, the Pato Town Hall show with Radio Birdman, the Saints, and the Hot Spurs. That gig seems to be one of legend. Um, can you share some memories of that particular show? Well, yeah, there there was three Paddington Town Hall shows that year in 77. And the one with the Saints was the first one. Uh, I think it was in April. That was the first time that the band rented a, a venue that large that could accommodate that many people. And uh, the Saints had recently moved from Brisbane to Sydney and we were helping them get gigs. We we were running uh, our own venue by then in Darlinghurst, and we had them play there. and And then we put this this uh, this show on and at the Paddington Town Hall. Yeah, I just remember it was. Well, I have some good and not so good memories of that show. Actually, mm-hmm. Chris Bailey uh, took some cheap shots at us that night. He 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 got up. When they got up on stage to play, after they finished, he said, now you're going to get to see Hitler Youth. That, that was his comment about introducing us. And um, I've never really got quite gotten over that. That was totally uncalled for. Um, but both bands played great, and the audience had a fantastic time and went crazy. And, and that set the stage for two more concerts at that same venue later that year, one in November and one in December. The December one was the last show we played in Australia before we left to go to the UK, you know, for Sire Records and go on tour with the Flame Groovies over there. And that last show at Paddington Town Hall was, that was the one that was really over the top, packed to the gills, and the place was destroyed. It was... I wouldn't exactly call it a riot, but it seemed more like just enthusiastic, you know, crazed uh, party atmosphere more than anything else. But but all the windows were smashed and cars up and down the street, Oxford Street were smashed, you know, were all were trashed. And and of course, uh, those are the days before before you got insurance. I mean, we didn't even think about that. Oh, were you held liable for it? Was it something that uh, you guys had to had to pony up for afterward? Yeah, it, it, yeah. That's why I never saw a cent of publishing for that first album. It all went to pay that off. <laughs> but um, that that gig was recorded on sixteen track mobile and very good recording. And um, that album is going to be reissued. It's I'm waiting for the test pressings. Now they're supposed to they're supposed to be en route to me. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to get that out with very high quality in time for the the tour. Oh, that's phenomenal. Because that was that was gonna be one of my questions. Pato Town Hall, 12th of December 77 is a is a great live show. I only have it on CD. The record is very collectible, a little bit out of the price range. So that is being repressed. Yeah, it's being repressed. We we uh, the mastering is top notch. Mm-hmm. Files were uh, or the tape was was mastered by um, uh, William Bowden in Tasmania, and and then the lacquer is cut by Levi Seitz in Seattle, and the the plates are made at RTI in LA. 
and shipped to the plant. And that's where we are now with that. We're re-releasing everything in sequence. And it just happens that that's the next one in the sequence, the third album out of seven. And, and it coincides with this tour. So that's fortuitous. So every one of the Radio Birdman albums... Well, it has, or it's it will be re-released. You have the tapes, you have everything you need to do that. Yeah, yeah, we have everything. There's a couple of them that have never been out on vinyl before. The remix of Living Eyes is one of them that's mm-hmm. never been on vinyl. And there's a live album called Ritualism that we did in 96 or 97, and that's never been on vinyl. There and was that- a release of that, I think, on Crying Sun on vinyl ritualism but that again same as a lot of the others it's highly collectible yeah cd only officially it may may well have been bootlegged but everything's been bootlegged on vinyl (laughs) but as far as the you know quality release that you want to listen to yeah so even the, the there was the recent reissue of uh the i guess the international version of radios appear the one that was recorded when you went to sire so yeah. I think I was familiar with that the, you had the, the tapes from Trafalgar and you found the ones for Living Eyes or they somehow came back to you. We'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. But the Sire tapes, you had the masters for those as well. Yeah. Any, anything different between those releases and the, the ones from the late 70s? Well, the, these days it's very difficult to, to make high-quality vinyl records because the uh you know the art of doing it has has mostly been lost most of the ones that are made today are done by machines you know they have a computer program that that does the mastering and it keeps everything well within the safe zone they don't get anywhere near distortion and and they don't push anything so records these days tend to sound pretty flat and there's there's only a few guys out there that really know how to do it from the old days. Mm-hmm. One of them was George Horn that worked at Fantasy, and he used to do the Credence records and things like that. We we had him before, but he died a couple of years ago. And they're all sort of falling by the wayside. But there's a guy, this guy up in Seattle, Levi Seitz, has the equipment. He's got the lathe, and he knows how to do it. So... What we're trying to do is match the quality of the 70s and 80s releases, which is actually it isn't easy to do in this day and age. So if we get it to sound like that, we'll be happy. Do you have the multi-tracks for some of the legacy albums? Yeah. Okay. It's a fun, kind of an odd story. We, I, this, was, this happened about uh, 10 or 12 years ago. I was living in in uh, in Sydney, and John called our manager. John called me, and he said that he had heard from the guys at Albert Studios up in up in Neutral Bay. Uh, you know, Albert's that's mm-hmm. where ACDC AC recorded. Yep, ACDC started that studio, Albert's, and we never recorded there. Never even set foot in the place. And Albert's called John and said, we found 20 boxes of multi-track tape, two-inch, 24-track tape. And it looks like it might belong to you. You want to come and pick it up. So John and I went over there. And sure enough, they just had these big stacks of tape boxes of tape and uh, all of our old sessions from Trafalgar were in there. And um, how, it, how it got there, we have no idea. Huh. How it ended up in our tape archive room. We have no idea. But we said, yeah, we'll take those back, thank you. And you know, and then we restored them, baked them, and, and did high quality transfers before the tape fell apart. Right. And, uh, and, and that was done successfully. As far as Living Eyes goes, that that one was recorded in Wales at Rockfield in 1978. And that recording session occurred right in the middle of the breakup 
between us and Sire. Sire dumped a whole bunch of bands from the label at that point in time. They kept a few, but they, they dumped almost everybody else. And, and uh, I don't think that that session probably ever got paid for. We were in, at Rockfield for three weeks and it's first class recording. I mean, you, sh you show up there, they give you a cabin to live in, like a farmhouse and cook all your meals. And, and there's, there's the, the studio and the engineer are on call 24 seven. You can work anytime you want. So we had three weeks there. And uh, so when we left, uh, we didn't get the tape, you know, we didn't, didn't have the masters. And I never thought we'd get them, that we'd ever see them again, because they belong to the studio until they get paid for. Hmm. The original Living Eyes uh, release was cut from a safety copy of the mixes that was at seven and a half IPS. So half the resolution of the actual master. And not the final mix is probably just a rough mix. Would that be fair? They were the final mixes okay. that, that were done, but but in retrospect, there were some things about the mixes that we would have done differently. Hmm. So fast forward to 96, 95, 96, I was working with Red Eye Records for my solo stuff. And John Foy, the boss of Red Eye, had the idea of trying to find that original, the original masters, multi-track masters for Living Eyes. And it was a long shot, but he actually managed to talk to Kingsley Ward, who runs Rockfield, who was kind enough to go in the into their archives and see if he could find them and found them. And uh, John had them couriered back to Sydney and we remixed them from the, the, the original masters and, and, uh, that is one of the albums that's going to come out in this sequence of reissues because that's never been out on vinyl, that remix. Right. It was part of the CD box set, if I recall. Is that the... Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It was released on CD on Red Eye. Mm -hmm. And then and then later appeared in the box set, but it's never been out on vinyl. So with, with all these recordings and you, know, you have the masters, you have the control of them, you're doing these these shows. They may be the final ones. They may not be. We'll see. When you look back on the legacy of Radio Birdman, are you quite satisfied? Is there anything you, you, you'd wish to change or any regrets regarding the releases or the legacy of the band? I don't think there's any regrets regarding the releases. Um, you know, we did the best we could in the studio with, with the resources that we had. And I don't... In my opinion, the the recordings are good, but they never really reached the level that the band could reach live, mm -hmm. and and that just may be the fact that there's no audience there, you know, giving you energy back while you play. Or I'm mm -hmm. not sure why, but they they're good. Recordings are great. This, I think the songs have stood the test of time. You know, they don't sound dated to me. And I still enjoy playing them. Uh, but, yeah, if we could have found a way to get more energy on those recordings uh, in the studio, I would do it. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the band's legacy, no, it's, it's you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of bands have told me that they, or, or have even said in interviews and things like that, that they... Uh, they're motivated by us or inspired or that, you know, had an impact on their career. And, and so when you do that, you know, we, like we, we took from, from our heroes and we added something to it and then we passed it along. And, and I think that's all anybody can ever hope to do. That's, that's perfect. Mm. So nothing left undone. The, all tapes are accounted for. Nothing lost. Nothing missing. Nothing that is left in a in a condition where you you wish it was different. No, 
No, not at all. Uh, I mean, every time you make an album you, there, you, you, and you listen to it later after thousands of hours of working on it and mixing it and doing all that stuff, you always go, oh, God, you know, there's a missed opportunity there and there's a missed opportunity there and we could have done this mm -hmm. better. That's that's inevitable. And, and, and there's absolutely no point in dwelling on that. Mm. So once the band split up, there were a few projects, one in particular, which I've really come to, uh, it, it never is very far from my record player, New Race. Um, oh. And in particular, the, the, the first and the last. Tell me the story of the New Race project. It's kind of a Detroit super group that played throughout Australia, yeah? We'll be back after these messages. Well, hey there, record collectors. There's a new service available that specializes in record cleaning, restoring, sticker removal, and professional grading. VMGVinyl.com VMG Vinyl can help you make the most of your collectible records. From professional cleaning of records and sleeves, removing old price tags and store stickers, dry cleaning and rejuvenation of old shrink wrap to make it look like new, even providing you a professional play-tested third-party grade with either removal grading or encasing in plastic you have a wide range of choices at vmgvinyl.com buying a highly collectible record and you want it checked out by an expert vmg vinyl can do that too head over there now and see what vmgvinyl.com can do for you and your collection that's vmgvinyl.com the one-stop shop for professional third-party grading cleaning and record restoration that's vmgvinyl.com Oh, and hey, record nerds, don't forget to clean your records with the very best and safest record cleaner, the Groove Washer. Make your records look and sound their very best and store them with confidence using the new Groove Washer Groove Guard record sleeves. You gotta try this out. It makes a huge difference to the quality of your vinyl experience. Ask for the Groove Washer by name at your local record store and accept no substitutes. Or head over to GrooveWasher.com and use discount code VINYLGUIDE. All hail the Groove Washer. That's GrooveWasher.com, discount code VINYLGUIDE10. Now we return to the program, already in progress. No limits. No limits. Once the band split up, there were a few projects, one in particular, which it never is very far from my record player, New Race, in particular, the, the, the first and the last. Tell me the story of the New Race project. It's kind of a Detroit supergroup played throughout Australia, yeah? Yeah, we when we released the first Living Eyes release in Australia and New Zealand, we we only released it in Australia and New Zealand because we were worried about Sire. They actually had the rights to it, but not in not in those territories. We retained the rights in Australia. So when we were releasing it in 1981, remember from that safety copy of the of the mixes, we wanted to have a tour to go with the release. And that is what became the new race tour. The band was still too uncomfortable with each other, let's say, to uh, get Radio Birdman back together, which would have been ideal, you know, to tour Radio Birdman. It's a Radio Birdman album. Couldn't do that. So it was Angie. It was my first wife, Angie, that had the idea of calling Ron and seeing if if he would bring uh, himself and his brother over, Ronnie and Scotty Ashton, and put a band together around that and tour. And uh, that was the original plan. And then Scott dropped out. He, not sure why, but he he couldn't go. And so Ron said, "Well, I'll call I'll call Thompson and see if he can go." Oh, so Scott was on board originally. Originally, he was going to be the drummer. Wow. Yeah. So Ron said, yeah, yeah, you'll like playing with Dennis Thompson. He's, you know, <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm sure I will. And uh, so the two of them came out and we got together with Rob and, and Warwick rejoined for bass. We re re rehearsed for a week, played around Australia. Yeah. New race. And then, and then that was, that album was recorded again and um, using high quality recording gear and, and, uh, and that album, the first and the last, was the result of that. 
that is such a phenomenal album. Um, is that also going to get the, uh, the, the reissue treatment at some point? Yes. Okay. Yeah. In the queue for that as well. As I understand, there's a couple different versions of the first and the last one of them, a bootleg. Um, obviously there's the official one. Uh, but the difference being Rob's vocals were re-recorded. Can you clarify kind of what happened there? Yeah. I found out about all of this later. I wasn't involved in the post-production work on that album at all because I was back in America. But uh, they took, we had, we had recorded three entire concerts and took the cream of that, the best, the best performances, best songs from those three to make one album. And Rob wasn't happy with his vocals. And this is, Rob is never happy with his vocals, okay? It's just, that's, that's just going to be a given. He doesn't like it. And he doesn't like live recordings for that reason of us. He was given the opportunity and he took it to re-record those vocals. So the official New Race album that came out has re-recorded vocals on it. Mm. And they sound fine. I mean, it's it's... The original vocals, I didn't think sounded bad at all. I, I thought he sang great, but he himself didn't like it. So that, that's the way it went. Now, Ron had tapes of all the three concerts, original rough mixes, just so that we could all listen to them and decide which songs we wanted to be on the album. So Ron's back in Ann Arbor by now. He's got these tapes. And he ended up selling the tapes to a French record company called Revenge Records. And the albums that came from that, they put two albums out from that. Um, I think the first to pay and the second wave. First to pay and the second wave, that's right. And and they had like John Wayne and Robert Mitchum on the, the covers. Yeah. And, and uh, so those, those albums were cut from rough mixes of the original material and had the original vocal on them. So you can hear on that that the vocal is quite good. But Rob was pissed when those bootlegs came out. I mean, they, they really are bootlegs. They, Revenge didn't see them as bootlegs because they had bought the tapes from Ron Ashton. Right. So they thought it was... They had permission and it was authorized and everything, but this this created bad blood between Rob and Ron, which went on for years. So when the first and the last does get reissued, it'll be reissued in its original form with Rob's redone vocals. Yeah. Okay. Did he wipe out the other tracks? Do you know the other the original vocals off the multi tracks? You know, that's a really good question. Uh I don't know. I don't know. I see a no. box set coming up. I, no. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I didn't realize is that your guitar is actually Fred Sonic Smith's guitar. Well, is that it right? was before I bought it. It was before. Yeah, exactly. Well, there, there is that lineage. T- tell me the story about that. You, you're actually playing Fred's guitar. and That's kind of your signature guitar. Yeah, I, I got that guitar in 73. This is this predates Radio Birdman. I was in a band called TV Jones then. And uh, I was back in Ann Arbor visiting family, and I just saw an advertisement for it. And the it turns out that they, you know, the five had broken up, and Michael Davis and uh, Fred Smith, no, no, Michael Davis and Wayne Kramer had gone to prison and they were just selling off all their stuff so that guitar was one of the things that was being sold and i bought it it came the case that it came in had the mc5 logo sprayed on it Mm. and it was really cool and it and turns out fantastic guitar it was cool for me to have an mc5 guitar but even cooler was the fact that it was the perfect guitar for me to play. It fit my hand perfectly. And it was just, it's just an amazing instrument. 
And so, yeah, that's the story. I, I bought it and took it back to Australia. And I don't know, I must have, must have played it at a thousand gigs. I don't know. Yeah. And it's, it's so associated with you. And, and what I thought was most interesting is when you were playing in the MC5 tour, the 2004, and you played numerous times with Wayne Kramer, you're actually playing those same parts on the same guitar. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's. I mean, nobody can replicate Fred Smith's parts exactly, but but I played an approximation of Fred's parts uh, and added some of my own into it on that sa exact same guitar. Yes. Yeah. I tried to buy it back. Yeah, uh, Fred Smith tried to buy the guitar back from me a couple of times uh, when we were when we were in London in 1978. Uh, we ran into those guys over there. Um, Iggy was doing a, a tour with basically the Sonics Rendezvous band as his backing band. He had, he had Fred Smith playing guitar and Gary Rasmussen on bass, Scotty Ashton on drums, and Scott Thurston on uh, keyboards. So we went to the show and 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 had dinner with them and and uh and fred asked me about the guitar he said he'd really like to buy it back and by that time i had owned the guitar and played the guitar a lot for a lot longer than than he had owned it and i said i, I really don't don't want to don't want to sell it back to you because this is my guitar now and he says okay fine and fred was a super nice guy he was always very, very quiet guy, kind of shy, but always, always good to me. It's always good to me. And, and, and he had me get up with Sonic's Rendezvous Band a couple of times and play City Slang using that guitar because he wanted to have a, extra guitars on that song. Apparently on the recorded version, there's 12 guitar tracks hmm. on the single. But anyway, um, and then after Fred died, Patty wanted it. But she wouldn't ask me directly. She asked Scotty to ask me if she could have that guitar back. And again, I, my answer was no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've, you've created a lot of history on that guitar yourself. What, what, what will happen to that guitar once, uh, once Dennis Tech joins the, uh, the Wayne Kramer band? My kids will get it. Yeah. I think yeah. the museum piece, we talked to Fat Mike at the Punk Rock Museum, and he wants to put together an Australian uh, display, Australian music, and he's getting some Saint stuff and, and, and the like. And, but one of the things we talked about is that Radio Bird, Dennis Tex guitar. How would that look in here, in, that, in this museum? He'll have, to, he'll have to talk to Hannah and Max about that and see you know, when, they, when they own it. Yeah. Fair enough, and I'm I'm assuming that's that guitar is going to be making a uh, an appearance at the Birdman Five O gigs. Thinking about it, um, I haven't played it. The last time I took it out on tour was was ten years ago. So, yeah, maybe uh, thinking about that right now. Mm -hmm. Is it a little that's bit a little bit worse for wear? Is a little, will it make the trip? Is that the worry? Oh no, it's 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 fine. It it looks like crap. You know, all the paint's gone and, and, and it's, it's, you know, it's got rust stains from where the screws have rusted into the pit guard and, and it, it looks terrible, but it's, it's actually quite intact and plays well. Yeah. Well, you've seen what Willie Nelson did to his guitar and it works fine. That, that guitar had the neck broken off three times. <laughs> okay. Well, I had, you know, while I was using it a lot and, and it, uh, the last time that happened. I took it to Dan Earlywine. You know who Dan Earlywine is? I do not. I do not. Whole story there, but but uh, he's a highly respected and renowned guitar luthier and guitar repairman you know, from Ann Arbor. Originally, he was the guitar player in the Prime Movers when Iggy was the drummer. Okay. And he was my first guitar teacher, but he he later. Uh, found fame as a, he, he wrote the guitar um, repair column in Guitar Player Magazine and wrote books on guitar repair and 
he was the man to get, you know, to fix your guitar. So I took it to him and he, he made that guitar. So that neck will never come off again. <laughs> he, he, he re put this reinforcement into the neck body joint, which was weak in those guitars to begin with. And, and he put uh, interlocking splines of wood to lock that neck in there. And then he refinished it so that it, the, the, the part that he worked on looked like it was exactly the same age as the rest of the guitar. You can't even see it. Mm -hmm. Look at the back of that guitar, the neck body joint, and you can't, you can't tell that it was ever worked on. It was just incredible. And he made a video, a, it's, it's like this 16 part video of him, how he did it and everything wow. for student, students to watch. Well, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see if that guitar makes an appearance in Sydney in, uh, in July. You've been working with the Citadel label for 40 years, maybe, maybe longer. I think originally from the 100 Fools single all the way to yeah. the to the current reissues of uh, of Radio Birdman. That's an extraordinary relationship to have with the label. Yeah. Well, my relationship with John Needham, the label manager, goes back further than that. He, I've been close friends with John since 72. Hmm. Uh, we shared a student house together in, <laughs> in Sydney, you know, and... Um, and so we sort of, we've been together ever since. And I, and I do want to point people over to uh, Citadel Mail Order for various uh, reissues and uh, a lot of Radio Birdman gear. And if you want a shirt like Anthony Albanese, well, they, they got those up there too. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> CitadelMailOrder.com. You also work with the Wild Honey Records in Italy, which is a, is a great label. I, I get a lot of stuff from them. Uh, they got some phenomenal bands, BBC and others. And uh, you've got a pretty strong relationship with them as well for your solo stuff. How did that relationship come together? It started with um, before the Wild Honey existed, the the label boss, Franz, Franz Barcella, was running tours in Europe. And uh, so he managed a couple of my solo tours way back. And we formed a friendship then. And uh, when Birdman got back together and started going back into Europe, I brought them into his touring agency, which was uh, a great relationship. And um, and then when he started the label, it was Nat. He just said, said "You know, get, what can, what can I put out on the label of yours?" and I said, well, I've got about 15 or 20 solo albums. Where do you want to start? <laughs> so he started at the beginning with Take It to the Vertical and um, and the Visitors album. And Outside is going to be the next one. And it's scheduled for a March release coming right up. There's going to be a double 12-inch vinyl of Outside with the original Outside from the CD right. and the um, and then additional, lots of additional tracks. And that's coming out on vinyl. That's coming out on vinyl. It's be a double 12 inch. Okay. I noticed on several of your solo albums, even right up to long before day, there's a U.S. version and I guess an international version, you know, with slightly different song sequences and inclusions. Uh, why the difference between the versions? That would depend on which one you're asking about. Um, well, like Long Before Day. I think Long Before Day, Mean Old Twister, there's slight differences. But Long Before Day, I know, has a, a different song song order. Well, Long Before Day uh, is only out on, on CD in America. Mm -hmm. There was no American vinyl of Long Before Day. So the only vinyl of that is European. Uh, obviously, there's... You know, CD and vinyl are going to have different, different song sequences. Hang on a sec. Let me, let me confirm, because I thought that there was two different versions. Don't mean to be pushy. 
Well, that's okay. <laughs> you, you probably know more about it than I do. Maybe I got to eat my words here. Maybe my research failed me, Dennis. And, and just handed me a note here. Uh, the vinyl has is came out in two different colors. Okay. The green one and a white one. Mm -hmm. Both on wild honey. But they're the same otherwise. And I think the green one was for Wild Honey's American distribution. And the the white marbly one was for their European distribution. But it's the same album and, and the same song sequence. I left the vinyl to Wild Honey because Franz has a one of his hats is that he works at a pressing plant mm -hmm. part time. And and so he has he has an ability to get head in the queue yeah. it's very hard to get vinyl press these days you know if you can find anybody that'll even take your order a lot of them won't even take your order anymore like third man you try to get something pressed there they won't even answer the phone furnace has where i used to get my records press my american pressings mm -hmm. Detroit and twister and uh lost for words pressed at furnace and they uh they have a two-year waiting time wow Erica, where we pressed the James Williamson album, the two to one, they won't take orders. They're fully booked. So it it was just too hard to do vinyl to for me to organize vinyl in America at this point in time. So just have Franz do it over there. He's he's got the pressing plant. Mm -hmm. Their press sound great. Let him do it. Fair enough. He also does these really interesting, I call them stunt records, uh, where, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a crazy packaging or something very ambitious. He's, he's creative. It, it, I'm, I'm a big fan of Wild Honey Records. One of the really collectible releases of the Radio Birdman catalog, I don't know if it's collectible so much, it's just obtuse, is the Soldiers of Rock and Roll album. There was a version of that album released showing, a, a, I think it's a German army on the cover. There were only about 30 copies that made it to the stores before it was recalled and reissued with a white cover. I think this was done in the days where you weren't even in Australia. What, what do you recall about that whole release? That, that completely took me by surprise. I had no idea they were even doing that. And it just seemed like a crazy concept anyway, you know, to have interview material on an album. It, it uh, of course, when we saw the cover, we said, had to say, stop, you know, what do you, you, you guys must have lost your minds. We're having enough trouble already with people, you know, yes, if there's any one thing I regret or would change, it would be that, we are labeled as having some sort of right-wing political affiliation, which nothing could be farther from the truth than that. But once you get something like that, it, it takes on a life of its own. And, you know, I mentioned to you what Chris Bailey said at that concert. Mm -hmm. and, and then there was an article that came out in the, in one of the Melbourne newspapers by written by Red Simons. He wrote an editorial complaining about us being Nazis. And this stuff takes on a life of its own. And if you put a cover like that on a record with our name on it, aren't you just throwing petrol under the fire? It's just insane. It's just insane. By the way, I'll just take this opportunity to, to say once and for all, Radio Burbank does not have any political affiliation whatsoever or, or inclination to do any sort of propaganda. And if, if there was any uh, political system that, that could be even remotely associated with us, it would be anarchy. Anything else, forget it. So yeah, so that, that album, Soldiers of Rock and Roll, it's just really misguided dumb idea which i if i would have been around and they would have asked me i would have never approved mm -hmm. i guess they did it because the band 
the band had stopped existing and they wanted to put something out. I, that's that's all I can think of. But something that provocative. Do you know who who approved that or who who designed that? Well, it, it had to come through Trafalgar, didn't it? It was WEA, I think. Yeah, but WEA, but Trafalgar was was who we were signed to. Right. And they were they were going through WEA. You know, the first album was on Trafalgar's own label, and then and then Trafalgar had a deal with WEA for reissues after that. Yeah, it just shows the label WEA. Yeah, I'm sure there's probably some sort of agreement in the back about usage of the music and everything. But yeah, well, Trafalgar is the is the middle entity that stands between us and WEA and mm-hmm. those and those '80s reissues. So suffice to say, Soldiers of Rock and Roll. Old cover, new cover, even won't won't be part of that re-release schedule. No. Okay. Fair enough. The visitors. How quickly after Birdman disbanded were the visitors formed? About a year later. And as I understand, there was about a dozen shows within Sydney. How how many recordings? Were there, there there seemed to be a lot of sessions, a lot of music that was generated by that band in that short period of time. Well, we only we only had one proper recording session, mm-hmm. and it was uh, Charles Fisher organized it, and it was at a little studio in Sydney called Palms. The Palms. The guy just had a Tascam eight track, mm. and we set up like live, and just played through our set, and then there were a couple of overdubs put on later at Trafalgar of uh, some vocal parts and but there were no guitar overdubs that was all done live and keyboards the guitar keyboards bass and and drums all live Hmm. and we recorded that whole album in one afternoon so that's that's the one and only recording session of the visitors everything we hear of the visitors came from that day came from that day uh yeah or or uh, people who recorded us at live concerts. Okay. Uh, one of few, those 12 live concerts. Yeah, there's a few of those out there. Wow. Uh, I think Dave Lang has uh, has some uh, live recordings of us that aren't too bad. Mm-hmm. And so, some of those recordings, they made it to a record on uh, Fant- they made it to a release on Phantom Records. Phantom Records uh, being associated with the Phantom Records store in Sydney, yeah? Yeah. What do you recall about that Phantom release and working with the record shop for that? Well, that was the first, you know, we had the, we had recorded these, our set in that session, in that one session. And then Phantom was Jules Normington and Dare Jennings, as I recall, Mm -hmm. uh, were running Phantom. And they said, can we, you know, can we put the put a record out, an EP from they'd heard about the sessions. Maybe I had played some of the songs to them. I don't remember exactly, but they offered to to do an EP and a 12 inch EP. And so yeah, okay, we'll 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 take these back into Trafalgar and you know and maybe add a backing vocal or two and you know, like we put a, put backing vocals on Journey by Sledge. I can't remember what else we did in there, but nothing to the music. It was just vocal parts that got fixed up. Mm-hmm. And uh, and they put it out as that that EP, four songs on Dana. And then it was much later, maybe a year or or more a year or two years later that uh, John Needham decided to do the whole thing as a full length LP on Citadel. Hmm. Again, crazy album cover. I mean, I don't know what these people are thinking really. It, I kind of like it now, but <laughs> at the time I'm going, what is this? These South American uh, like totems or statues? Yeah. Green, yellow, and silver as a color combination. Who thinks this stuff up? The, the the photo on the back of the album though is great. That cover always struck me as very I don't know. The the, the 80s were a weird time. <laughs> kind of crazy, but like I say, I, I like it now. 
<laughs> well, people want to hear what we're talking about. There's also a, you know, Dennis Tech's website, DennisTech.com. You you document a lot of these things very, very well. But the visitor's music is also available. Again, there's a reissue from Wild Honey you can get yeah. online. You've got a lot. I mean, ac- the access and the, the filing and, and preservation of your music you, you, has been phenomenal. We speak to so many artists who have no idea where their tapes are, and you seem to have kept them all together quite well throughout your life. Uh, so, we're so lucky that 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 Albert Studios called us. Did, they those, just that did, stuff in a dumpster. Yeah, those those Trafalgar Masters. You must have found outtakes, different songs on it, and anything unique you found on those recordings. Hundreds, hundreds of things that I didn't even remember doing that were on those tapes. And I spent weeks going through everything that was, that was on there. And it was only the very best or most interesting stuff that made it into that box set. So you've got the Birdman shows coming up. You've got a, a whole slate of reissues coming up. How about new music? What else do you have on the, uh, in the hopper? Right. I have the great good fortune of having recorded several tracks, many tracks with Rick Parnell that have never been finished. Um, these recorded about well, seven or eight years ago. On some of them, it's it's all just me playing rhythm guitar and some soloing and him playing drums, just the two of us uh, on these tapes. And on some of them, the guitar is quite good and usable. On others, it needs to, the guitar needs to be replaced, but the drumming tracks are perfect and they sound great. And uh, they were mic'd properly and recorded properly and his performances are stellar. So I'm building on that to, for a new album. Okay. Is that something you think we'll see in 2024? You got a pretty packed year. So is that something we'll see sooner than later? I'm going to try to have it finish the recording of it finished before the Birdman tour. Hmm. And then it'll be in the pipeline. So we'll see if Wild Honey wants it or who Cleopatra or whoever wants it. Maybe by the end of the year or maybe early next year, see the light of day. But I'm, I'm really excited about it because the drumming is so fantastic. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be really featured. And the, these songs are being built around those drum tracks. And it's, I've never really recorded or written that way before. I've, yeah. I've never written a song to a specific drum part before, but I'm doing that now. And it's really interesting. And it's it's coming out quite differently than I expected, but very cool. Excellent. Well, we look forward to that. It's always, it's always great when we get a new uh, Dennis Tech release out. And uh, we've been fortunate enough to have a pretty steady stream of them in the last several years. So... Look forward to that continued streak. Um, one last thing before we wrap up, and this isn't so musical, but I, I just want to get your uh, your story, your angle on this. The uh, the Top Gun call sign, as we understand, the uh, Val Kilmer's character in there was known as the Iceman, which I believe was your call sign. There may have been a little bit of uh, lifting of that name. How do you remember the story, or, or, or what's your angle on that story? Well, yeah, I'm the original Iceman, okay? Right. So it was the call sign before the movie. The movie people came out, you know, when they were making that movie, they were doing research by go- sending people out to see how a fighter squadron actually operated. Mm-hmm. And so the team came to our squadron and, and kind of lived with us for two weeks. They hung around, you know, they, when we walk out to the airplanes, they walk out to the airplanes with us. They never got any rides, but they really looked at every aspect of it and they made notes. And of course, Michael, everybody has their call sign on their name tag, on their flight suit and on their helmet. And so they would have seen it. They would have seen that there was an Iceman in that squadron. And then they go go away, and then a year and a half or two years later, the movie comes out, and it has an Iceman. Was that just a coincidence? Yeah, maybe. 
maybe they that was, maybe that was already written into the script before they they ever you know ran into me i don't know but um the legend that grew around that is that they got the call, call sign from me i don't know if that's true maybe may, maybe it's not i don't i really don't know uh, which came first <laughs> Movie people d deny it. They they when asked they they say, well, no, we uh, any resemblance to people living or dead in this movie is purely coincidental. They have to say that, but who knows? Were, were, the you, were you still the using the Iceman call name when the movie came out? Yeah, yeah, but it ruined it. Okay, how did it ruin it? Well, there's this silly movie, right, which really wasn't very realistic at all about naval aviation, and and and, and had had a lot of Hollywood slapped on it that uh, you know real pilots would look at and go, "Oh God, yeah. that would never happen." But uh, and then the character was not the most savory person either. The Val Kilmer character, he was you know he was kind of an asshole. And then, of course, after the movie comes out, oh, you, that's where you got your call sign from. You know, I didn't totally ruin it, but, you know, my friends that I get together with from the squadron still call me Iceman and 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 they don't think they don't think twice about it. <laughs> so you didn't change your name to something else just to avoid the hassle. One of the things about the Navy and, and this doesn't apply to the Air Force, they're different. But in the Navy and in the Marine Corps, once you get your call sign, it can never be changed. Almost never. It takes an extraordinary event to change a person's call sign. You have it for your whole your whole life from then on. So you want to get a good one. I mean, because if, if you don't get a good call, that's too bad. You're stuck with it. I mean, we had some, we had some pretty funny ones, but uh, anyway. <laughs> so you're still the Ice Man. You're... I'm still the yeah. Ice. Okay. All right. Especially when I go to those uh, Phantom Pilot reunions, which I went to one last year, and uh, God, that was fun seeing those old guys. Mm -hmm. Oh man, you got to write a book. Hopefully, is there a book in progress? There is. There is a book in progress. Good. It's not focusing too much on the music because that's that part's being covered by Murray Engelhart. Did you know that Murray's got a book coming out this year? I do not. I did not know that. It's okay for me to talk about it. It's uh, he's written the definitive book about Radio Birdman, and its um, release date is scheduled for June. The publisher, it's all approved. It's it's in the final editing stages now. The manuscripts went in last September, but he worked on this book for several years mm -hmm. and he went into great depth about everything because he was doing that i'm not gonna i don't want to cut across that you know it's it's like he's he's really got the the definitive saga coming out and yeah there will there will be some music stories that that he doesn't know about that I, that i'll put in but mostly it'll be other stuff Right. Well, you've, you've lived a big life, so there's plenty to cover. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe there'll even be one at the, uh, those books available at the, at the merch table at the, at the five O shows. We'll see what happens. Uh, but again, Dennis, thank you so much for coming on the show. And it's always a pleasure to talk to you again, folks go to citadelmailorder.com, Especially if you're in uh, Australia, you could also check uh, Dennis's band camp, denistech.bandcamp.com or wildhoneyrecords.bandcamp.com uh, you could also go to denistech.com there's a lot of coverage and a lot of um, information on the various releases and stories behind those records that we collect Dennis again congrats on 50 years of Radio Birdman long may you fly and uh, we'll see you in Australia in June and July sounds great Nate thanks we'll see you then What an absolutely lovely dude. Thank you, Dennis, for coming on the show. And uh, 
I got to, if you're listening to this and you're in Australia, you need to get your Radio Birdman 5 tickets quick. Uh, Sydney has had three shows. They have three shows. Two of them have already sold out. So wherever you're at, if tickets are available, snap them up quick because, you know, this is probably, you heard what he said. It's probably going to be the last time you're going to be able to see him live. And, uh, man, what a show. I just saw him a few years ago and, uh, absolute legend. So catch him while you can. Radio Birdman 5.0. And, uh, by the way, we've got an extended version of this interview available only to show patrons, patreon.com slash vinyl guide. Uh, while Dennis and I were talking, he had an earthquake. Uh, and uh, it's kind of funny. We're uh, we're talking through it. So um, that's only up at the Patreon feed, the extended version. So uh, join us up there, patreon.com slash vinyl guide. And thank you in advance for your support. And that's it for this episode of the Vinyl Guide. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hey, do me a favor. Jump up on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and leave us a positive review. All right, say something nice, five out of five stars. That is always super helpful. Big thanks and big ups to everyone out there who's sharing these episodes on social media and putting them in the Reddit forums and the Facebook groups. That's hugely appreciated. And uh, we'll be back shortly with a brand new episode. So until we talk next time... Get out there and buy some records, people. Cheers. That's it for this episode of The Vinyl Guide. Follow The Vinyl Guide in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever podcast app you use and enjoy the full back catalog of episodes of The Vinyl Guide podcast. Thanks again for listening.